So, um, as we have seen over the last couple of weeks, um, Acts chapter 2, if you could summarize the whole chapter, uh, really is the creation story of the New Testament church. And this last week, I was processing this, thinking it through. And one of the things that, that occurred to me is that this creation story, in many ways, parallels and echoes the original creation story of Genesis chapter 1. One. So if you're taking notes, you can jot that down. Genesis 1. Um, how so? Well, when you read Genesis 1, it's almost like a, a symphony. There are these different movements to the drama. Um, it begins, of course, Genesis 1 with chaos, right? It says the world was without form and void. Darkness was over the deep. But then we see the moving of God's spirit. Genesis 1 says God's spirit hovered over the waters, participating in this creation and them. Um, and then the word, God the Father speaks. So God's word became the instrument of creation. And then as a result of that was life. So from absolutely nothing, God creates life. Trees and plants, flowers, animals, birds, fish, humanity. And then the last step is blessing. So God takes a step back and he looks at his creation and he says three words. It is good. So God saw Cannon Beach and Haystack Rock and he said, it is good, right? He saw the gorge and epic waterfalls. It is good. He saw donut holes after the 10 a.m. gathering at Westside and he said, it is very good, right? So, so God he speaks blessing over his creation. So like a symphony, you see movements, chaos, spirit, word, life, and blessing. Now this is what hit me. Those same movements that you see in this creation story are the same ones that you see in a recreation story of Acts 2. Acts 2, the creation of the early church, and it begins, as we saw, with chaos, right? What happens on the day of Pentecost? Well, there's a mighty rushing wind, tongues of fire, languages, and then God's spirit comes down, moving in the upper room, empowering the disciples for mission, the word, Peter gets up, shares scripture, life, 3,000 people are rescued, baptized, they join the family of faith, and then finally, blessing. In fact, you could look down at the last verse of Acts chapter 2, and it says here that God added to the church daily those who were being saved. So God here is pouring out his grace, his shalom, his blessing on this new creation. This is God's way of saying, it is good. So at its core, Acts chapter 2 is a story of creation. So what we've done over the last few weeks is we've looked at this story of creation, and we've asked some questions. Okay, what does this look like? How did they live their lives? What were their rhythms and practices? Last week, we talked about their devotion, their laser-like focus. Uh, the week before, Phil shared with us on their generosity. But, but what I want to do before we leave chapter two is I want to look at one more aspect of this new creation, and as I mentioned, how they were a community of worship. You know, in the book of Job, there's this really interesting verse. It says that when God created the heavens and the earth, the angels were joining God in this creative moment through singing and worship. So worship was the soundtrack to creation. And what I want to argue is here in Acts 2, as the church is being brought into being, worship is the soundtrack. Worship is the anthem as they celebrate the beauty and the presence of God. And, and I think we see this right at the beginning of the chapter. Some of these verses are review, but let's look down, verse one. It says, when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. And suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. And they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated them and came to rest on each of them. And all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit, and they began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. 
Now they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. And when they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in our native language? Now skip down to verse 11. We hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they ask one another, what does this mean? So here Luke uh, tells us what happens on the day that the church was created. So they're gathered in an upper room. The spirit comes down. Now, what is the very first thing that the church does after God brings them into creation? Well, our text says they worship. In fact, look down verse 11. It says, they were declaring the wonders of God. If you're taking notes, the word wonder in in the Greek language is the word megaleos. Sounds like a villain in an Avengers movie or something, right? Um, But it literally means to celebrate God's power, um, his greatness, and his beauty. So Luke says the very first act of this new creation, more than anything else, is they wanted to worship the God who had made them. So in a few weeks, I have the privilege of getting to marry uh, Daniel and uh, Sarah. You met Daniel last week. Some of you already know him. He was up on stage. He's our high school director. Amazing guy. If you haven't met him yet, you need to. Um, But he and Sarah, they met, fell in love in North Carolina. He was actually part of the Emmaus church plant. And now I have the opportunity to actually marry them. And so in a few weeks time, uh, they'll stand before me and I'll go through scripture and then we'll pray together, exchanging of vows, exchanging of rings. And then I'll say, by the power invested in me by Oregon, I now pronounce you man and wife. Now, after I make that pronouncement, what do I say next? And it's the words that Daniel's been longing to hear for years, right? You may what? Kiss your bride, right? Now, have you ever wondered why, why a kiss? Why, why is the kiss traditionally the first thing that a married couple does? does. Well, a kiss is our way of saying this is a sacred and beautiful moment, right? That the kiss is an expression of the kind of marriage that we want to have. It's a, an expression of worship and, and wonder. In fact, check this out. Did you know that that is what the Greek word for worship actually means? If you're taking notes, in Greek, the original language worship is the word proskuneo. And proskuneo um, comes from two words, pros, which means towards, and kaneo, meaning to kiss. So literally then, worship is kissing, right? It's, it's the giving of your love and your affection and your adoration. Now check this out. That's what we see the early church doing here in Acts 2. God, the creator, brings them into existence. And the anthem of that moment is the people of God turning to kiss their creator. Luke says they were declaring his wonders. So the church begins with worship. And we'll see um, over the next 39 years as we go through the book of Acts um, that the church continues to worship. Um, If you're taking notes, you can write this down. Worship defines them as a community of God. Um, In verse 46, for example, um, it says they were worshiping God in homes throughout the city. In Acts 3, Peter and John go to a temple. Acts 9, they worship in synagogues. Acts 10, in Cornelius' house. Acts 16, in prison. And Acts 20, in Jerusalem. So this is a community that every opportunity they got, they were worshiping. In fact, I was reading um, uh, Philo. He was a first century historian and he records of what, a lot of what was happening in the ancient world in Rome. And one of the comments he makes about the early church, he says, this group of people loved to worship. In fact, Philo tells us that they would have all night worship sessions, <laughs> kind of like our women's night of prayer, which by the way, I'm so excited for that. You women are leading the charge in what God is doing in this church. And they were committed to that in the ancient world, all night long, worshiping, celebrating, praising, loving their God. So the story of the early church is a story of worship. Worship. 
It began in worship, and for generations, the story continues with worship as the soundtrack. Now, let's take it deeper, because I know for most of us, that's not any news, right? You you know that the church worshiped. We're familiar with that. But I want to go deeper and ask the question, how? Like, if you could be a fly on the wall in one of their worship gatherings, what would that look like? How did they express their worship to God? And I just want to share um, a few thoughts with you. If you want, you can jot some of the, these things down. Um, but the first thing that strikes me in Acts 2 and throughout the New Testament is that they worshiped with passion. They worshiped with passion. Um, and, and we see that here, right? Uh, the word proskuneo, kiss. It's a word of passion. It's a word of emotion and intensity. If you're going to kiss someone, there has to be some passion behind it. So <laughs> let's say on that day when I marry Daniel and Sarah. Imagine how weird it would be if I said to Daniel, you may kiss your bride. Imagine if he was like, took, take a step back. I don't know if I feel comfortable with that. No touchy, right? I'll shake your hand maybe. That would be really awkward, right? I would sign up for some marriage counseling because worship or kissing, right, is a sign of intimacy, commitment. And and the same thing is true for the early church. There's a commitment here. There's a passion here. And the two go hand in hand. Um, We see it here, Acts 2, the day of Pentecost. When they worship, they're worshiping with a loud voice. In fact, it was so loud that people outside the gathering could actually hear what was going on. And they're like, what is happening? And then it was a pretext for Peter to share. Um, But here's some other verses. Um, In Ephesians 5, verse 19, um, Paul, speaking of the early church, he says, one of the ways that they would worship is, well, what we did today, music and singing. Um, In 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 8, um, he says that we can worship through the lifting of our hands, right? Now, this is a tradition that has been part of Jewish culture for centuries and part of Christian culture for, for millennia. And, and you may notice, like, in gatherings such as this one, many, many people feel comfortable with worshiping in this way, lifting their hands. It's a sign of surrender and giving your heart to God. And, and Paul says, as the church, we should do that, and they were a part of that as well. Um, Ephesians 3, verse 19 says that they would bow. They would bow in worship. Now, check this out. In Greek, worship is proskuneo, to turn and to kiss. But did you know that in Hebrew, uh, the word for worship is sagad, and it means to bow or to lay flat on the ground. Fascinating. So this is a group of people that believed that worship was not only spiritual, but worship was physical. Um, They saw their physical bodies as a means to express their love and their devotion to God. And you know what? I would argue that is true, not just of Christian worship, but of any form of worship. Everyone worships, and worship is holistic. What you do with your body reveals what and who you worship, right? So... A couple days ago, I wasn't at the game, but I heard it was amazing. Blazers, Moda Center, right? Come from behind victory. Now, what happens in those last minutes when your team comes from behind? And let's say a three-pointer is scored. Everyone jumps up, right? Hands are lifted in the air, screams and shouts for joy, right? Or you meet the girl, you fall in love, and then the time comes when you want to ask that question. What do you do? You go on your knees, right? Will you marry me? Your physicality, what you do with your body, is an expression of worship. I would argue the same thing is true in your walk with the Lord. The more that you learn about him, the more that you love him, the more you'll find, I know many of us are on this journey, (laughs) the more you find you begin to want to express that love and that intimacy through physical ways. That is why week by week we gather in this place, we we sing, we lift hands, we, we bow, and the reason that we do that is because we want to engage our physicality with the reality of God's love. Um, Frederick Buchner, he, he said this. I love this quote. He said, make a fool of yourself for him <laughs> the way lovers 
have always made fools of themselves for the ones that they love. Man, that was the heart of the early church, in love with Jesus and now expressing that in passion and emotion and through physical means. So number one, worship with passion. Uh, Number two, we see this all throughout Acts, they worshiped in community. Um, Let me draw your attention back to verse one. It says, when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. So Luke says, when they worshiped, it wasn't done alone or in isolation, but this was something they did together in community. Now, sometimes it was in large gatherings like this one in Jerusalem, as we saw, day of Pentecost, spirit comes down, 3,000 are saved, right? World's first mega church. they're worshiping and praising God. But if you look down at verse 46, sometimes it was in homes, right? A group of people sitting on couches, sipping coffee, worshiping, fellowshipping together. They believed in the power of worshiping in community. And where did they get this from? Well, I would argue they got this from their scriptures, which would have been the Old Testament. You see this over and over again. Um, A few months ago, we did a, a series on the book of Psalms, and I'm finding myself keep going back to Psalms. It's so beautiful, and there's so much there. And I was reading last week in, in Psalm 95, which is essentially a psalm of worship to God. And what hit me, I'd never noticed this before, is the language of community. I mean, check it out. He says, come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving. Come, let us bow down in worship. Let us kneel before the Lord, our God, our maker. This is the language of family. And and it's this language you see all throughout scripture. Now, I do believe that we should have times of worshiping alone, right? Times where it's just you and God and you're seeking him and pouring out your heart to him. But something that I'm learning from scripture is that when you worship in in community, when we worship like what we're doing today, there's a depth and and I think a profoundness, a a beauty that happens in that moment. Um, C.S. Lewis, he, he talks about this in his book, The Four Loves. And if you've read that book, you know, he talks about um, two of his closest friends, um, a guy named Ronald and a guy named Charles. And they were like the best of friends, did a ton of things together. But then tragically, um, Charles died. And as Lewis was coming to terms with this loss, um, one of the things that he discovered was that he not only lost Charles, and that was heartbreaking enough, but when Charles died, he also lost a part of his other friend, Ronald, why? He argues, he says, there were things in Ronald that would only come out when Charles was around, (laughs) right? You all have friends like that. Parts of your humor and personality, they bring out the best in you or maybe the worst in you or whatever, right? And he says, that's what happened. Like when, when he was around, Ronald would come alive in certain ways. But when Charles died, he says, those things in Ronald died as well. Now, if you keep reading the chapter, he, he moves it from the realm of friendship to worship. And, and he says, when we worship in community, each person that you're worshiping with reflects something of the beauty and the character and the nature of God, which means that when we come to places like this to worship, we are learning more of who he is. The church is most beautiful when it's most diverse. And that is why heaven is gonna be so unbelievable because not only will we see God individually and and, and that alone is gonna be so incredible, but we will see God through the lens of community. So there will be a depth and a color that we've never imagined, an intensity that we've never dreamed of. Heaven will be like going from 2D to 3D. In the words of Revelation, every tribe, every nation, every language, every people group, standing, singing, worshiping our creator. And that's what I love about Acts 2. Because Acts 2 not only 
points backwards to the creation of the world in Genesis, but it also points to the creation of new heavens and new earth in the book of Revelation. Multitudes of people here in Acts 2, every tribe, every language, every people group, they're singing, they're worshiping, they're praising him in community. So that's why, brothers and sisters, whenever we come to a place like this, we are getting a glimpse of heaven. We are pushing forward into a future reality where every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. The early church recognized that. They lived for that in community. They worshiped with passion, lifting hands, bowing their knees, singing with all of their heart. But check this out. I think it goes even deeper. Um, Number three, they worshiped God with their life. If I could draw your attention to verse 43, um, it says, everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. And all the believers were together and they had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. And every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes. They ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. So Luke closes Acts 2 and he says, because of all that God was doing, there was a sense of awe that came upon the people. And then he goes on to say they were praising God, which is in the present tense, which means they were continuing in the spirit of worship. Now, for you note takers, you may wanna circle the word awe. It's a fascinating word. Um, It's actually where we get our word for awesome, um, awe-inspiring, but it's also where we get our word for phobia or fear. Uh, In Greek, it's the word Phobos, and uh, I found this really, really fascinating. Um, now, and I actually be- began to do a little research on phobias, and uh, I learned something um, that in America, this kind of surprised me, that did you know that six million Americans, the number's growing, have actually diagnosed phobias, and, and, and they're r- really interesting what these phobias are. It, it listed some of the top phobias, and then it got really some of the more bizarre ones that people have. Guess what the number one phobia is in America? Someone said spiders. No. Nope. Public speaking. That does not bode well for me, right? <laughs> like, evidently, I conquered that fear. But uh, so that pe- some people would rather die than get up on a stage in front of a crowd of people. So the fear of public speaking is number one. Number two is death. <laughs> And number three, someone said, spiders. <laughs> That's interesting. So this is the third phobia in America. But then um, the article goes on, and it's talking about some of the, and these are actual diagnosed phobias that people have, and it gets really bizarre. But these, these are diagnosed. Here we are. Um, here's one. Philophobia. Now, this is, this is not the, the fear of Phil Comer. Um, <laughs> but philophobia is the fear of falling in love. Fascinating. Some, pe- some people are actually terrified of falling in love. Um, here's one. <laughs> this one's called calignophobia, and it's the fear of beautiful women. So evidently, there's some guys out there, like a beautiful woman walks into the room, they're like, ah, I have a panic attack or something, right? <laughs> now, I, <laughs> I actually had that phobia when I met my wife, right? Brownie points right there. <laughs> and then here's one. A blutophobia. <laughs> this, this is the fear of taking a bath. Now you may think my roommate has that fear. Maybe the person you're sitting next to. I don't know. So it's interesting, this whole thing of phobias. Now back to the text. Luke here, <laughs> Luke is saying that something happened that When the early church, they they saw the moving of God's spirit and the thousands of people getting saved and the church being brought into existence, that it was almost like a phobia, this fear, this awe. It was overwhelming. Something was happening that they had never seen before. So they're worshiping and as a byproduct, now check this out, as a byproduct of their worship, he goes on to say, this is what the church did. And this is where it just gets so, I think, profound. They shared, they sold property, and they gave to those in need. Now, this is what I want us to note. The way 
that the early church expressed worship was not just singing, but it was surrender, right? This is a deeper, for me at least, a deeper understanding of what worship is. Worship is not just giving to God your passion. That's important. I'm praying that for us as a community that we would continue to grow in that area, that we would be expressive in the way that we relate to God in our worship, whether it's lifting of hands or singing or however God leads you. But, but it's more than that. It's deeper than just your, your passion because if you worship and it doesn't actually change your life, then it's not worship, right? So, so it's deeper than passion and, and it's also deeper than community because it's possible to come to a place like this and be around people who are worshiping and yet your heart's not engaging with God. So what this is showing me is that true worship is surrender, right? Worship is an all of life response to the goodness and the beauty of God. Worship is the recognition that you're in the presence of something that is greater than yourself. Oh my gosh, awe, amazement, uh, uh, phobos, what, what the philosopher Thomas Carlyle called that sense of transcendent wonder. And the only rational response in that moment is to give up control and to relinquish anything and everything that may be holding you back. So a few years ago, um, I saw this show. I think I've only seen it once or twice. I, I think this was when I was in Hawaii. Um, ha- have any of you seen it? It's a PBS series um, called Antique Roadshow. Uh, <laughs> And it's really interesting. Um, Basically, if you haven't seen it, the premise is like um, assessors of antique goods. Uh, They they travel around the nation. They go to these cities. They set up um, shop. And then they invite people from the community uh, because a lot of us maybe have some antiques or things passed on. Come and get it assessed and appraised and find out what it is and maybe how much it's worth. And so on this one show I saw, it's so classic. This guy shows up and he has this blanket with him, this whole kind of beat up blanket. And he has it wrapped around his shoulder and he just kind of throws it on the table real casually. He's like, you know, I've had this thing for years and it's kind of an unusual blanket, so I've always wondered about it. Probably not worth anything, but uh, you you guys mind assessing it? And so they start looking at it and and they're evaluating and then it begins to generate some electricity, like there are these whispers and then they call over some backup and they spend all this time like investigating and looking at it and researching and finally when they were all done, they call him over and they put the blanket on this table and they say, sir, your blanket is one of the earliest and most complete Navajo weavings in existence today. It was made for a Navajo chief right around 1840 and and we think it's worth right around (laughs) $500,000. His jaw just hits the ground, right? Now, what was so classic about this show is because, well, remember how he shows up, right? He has it wrapped around, throws it down, all casual. When he left, he's like holding it like this. He's got security guards on either side of him, makes a beeline for the bank. Now, the blanket didn't change, right? It's the same blanket. But what did change was his understanding, That's the heart of worship. Worship is the realization, wow, I am in the presence of something that is so precious and so valuable that the only recourse and response is surrender. Surrender of my heart and fear and pride and possessions and life, it all belongs to you. The theologian Harold Best said this, uh, and with a name like Best, you know it's gonna be good, right? He said, worship is acknowledging that someone or something else is greater. And by consequence, to be obeyed, feared, and adored, worship is the sign that in giving myself completely to someone or something, I want to be mastered by it. That is what we see in the early church. Listen, when when Luke, who wrote the book, says, oh yeah, and they sold possessions and they gave, 
This is not some weird like communism thing, Marxism first century style. This is not legalism. This isn't their way of saying, how do we make God happy? Um, Like the bumper sticker I saw the other day, um, it said, Jesus is coming back. And then right below it said, so act busy, right? That's not what's going on. This isn't a group of people trying to be busy for busy's sake. No, at its core, their giving, sharing, loving, serving was an act of worship. The church was in awe of God, and so in response to that love, they're giving to him and to others. Tim Keller, he put it this way. In religion, you obey because God is useful. But in Christianity, you obey because God is beautiful. And that's the heart of Acts 2. This is a group of people in love with a beautiful God, And in response to that, they worship with passion, in community, but more importantly, with their life. So brothers and sisters, Westside family, this is where I want to take a step back just for a second. I just want to ask a really simple, probing question. Are we, are you, (laughs) worshiping God in this way? Every single one of us worships something, right? Career, self-image, might be relationships, possessions, sex. Malcolm Muggridge said, sex is the mysticism of the materialist. Hey, even atheists and materialists worship. Part of being human is to worship. Worship is the soundtrack of the human story. And because you were made in the image of God, listen, because you are the Imago Dei, his image, the only thing that will satisfy you and satisfy me is when we give ourselves fully to him and worship him with our life and thus fulfilling the reason that we were created. So I ask, are you worshiping God in this way? I think we could put it this way. Um, Does God have all of you? Are you surrendered fully? Or could there be areas of your heart right now that you're holding back and you, and you know it? You know those places in your heart you haven't fully given to him. For some, I know, it's just hurt, disappointment with God, maybe pain. You went through something years ago or recently and it's just been a barrier between you and God. Uh, Maybe it's unforgiveness or fear. Maybe it's some addiction or sin or maybe anger. Listen, whatever it is today, right now, Jesus wants to set you free from that. Today, Jesus invites you to lay all of that down and to step into the life of worship that he has for you. Paul put it this way, Romans 12, verse one. Therefore, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. That's everything, right? Holy and pleasing to God for this, this is the heart of worship. 